Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Scott Cooper. He's a managing partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Scott, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you on the show. I, I think basically anybody that's been in technology has heard of you and, and the firm. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure, I grew up in uh, Houston, Texas, actually. So, okay, very cool. Uh, and my uh, my family my family is still there. And uh, as uh, for people who know me uh, around here, you'll see me wearing cowboy boots most of nice. the time as uh, a little bit of a tip to my heritage. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you went to university. What did you take, and why? Yeah, I went to Stanford, okay. and uh, I was actually a public policy major at Stanford, which is kind of like you know, some economics and some political science is kind of a mixture of a bunch of stuff. Um, why I did it, uh, I think mostly I uh, I was kind of just looking for something that was, quite frankly, intellectually interesting. And uh, okay. I was, uh, as much as I kind of uh, liked math and science, I was pretty sure from a career perspective that that wasn't the direction I was going. So this seemed like, you know, the next best alternative, I guess. No, very cool. And And you got your law degree as well, correct? I did, yeah, at Stanford as well. So, what made you decide to go into law after? I um, uh, I went to law uh, school thinking I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. Um, that was kind of my intention. And uh, but like a lot of people who go to law school, uh, I hadn't actually ever worked as a lawyer before, or didn't really, quite frankly, even understand what the job of a lawyer was. Gotcha. And I always thought kind of you know business transaction stuff was interesting. Sure. And uh, but what I found was uh, I was more interested interested in the business side of the business transactions than the legal side, and so that was why I kind of despite the fact that I went to law school, I ended up actually you know taking a different turn uh, from a career perspective. Sure. So. Walk us through your career up until Andreessen Horowitz, maybe some career highlights along the way because you've done a ton of stuff. Sure, absolutely. So I started uh, out here in uh, 96, 97, which was kind of the beginning of what turned out to be the tech bubble that we all know and love from 99, sure. 2000. And uh, I initially uh, worked in the investment banking industry. So what that meant was I was taking companies public. I was helping companies make acquisitions. Uh, and as I talk a little bit about in the book, uh, many of the names of the companies uh, that I took public, unfortunately, probably uh, you have not heard of because many <laughs> of them had incredibly strong rises up and then, you know, some spectacular failures on the downside of the dot-com bubble. But uh, through that experience, I got introduced to Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz when they were starting a company called LoudCloud in 1999. And it turned out that actually a friend of mine who was at a, a company whose company I had taken public – he quit after the after the IPO of his company uh, to join Mark and Ben uh, in this company called LoudCloud. And uh, at the time, LoudCloud was basically trying to build uh, Amazon Web Services, what that is today. So we were, we had this idea that you know compute could just be a utility, and you didn't have to worry about your database, you didn't have to worry about networking. You could just write your code and magically plop it onto you know kind of a system, and it would just run beautifully. And uh, like a lot of things in venture capital, and I talk also about this a little bit in the book, um, you know, kind of it was a great idea that was probably a little bit before its time. And so it's it's funny now to see, obviously, the tremendous success of Amazon Web Services, but also, quite frankly, lots of other ideas that didn't work in 99, 2000, but that are now working as companies. And uh, so sometimes, you know, timing timing actually does matter in these businesses. Sure. So um, go ahead. Then, sorry. Uh, Keep yeah, going. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So um, anyway, so uh, uh, I was at this company, LoudCloud Opsware, for a long time. Uh, we eventually sold that company to Hewlett Packard in 2007. Very cool. And, um, you know, after that, what was happening was Mark and Ben did a bunch of angel investing on their own. And uh, in 2008, uh, they uh, approached me and said, hey, this angel investing is a lot of fun, but we think we can have a bigger impact on the startup ecosystem if we institutionalize this and go raise a, a traditional fund, uh, you know, for, from uh, regular institutional investors. 
And so I was lucky enough to be employee number one and, uh, you know, have been here for 10 years since. Wow. That's, that's very cool. So I, I think at this point, everybody's heard of you guys, but do you maybe just want to give a little bit of a quick overview of what Andreessen Horowitz does and who you guys are? And then I want to get right into the book. Absolutely. Yeah. So we are a venture capital firm, which basically means we invest money in very early companies. Sometimes those companies literally are just a couple people who have sure. an idea and haven't built anything yet. Very cool. And uh, we work with those companies sometimes over five, seven, 10, 12 years. And uh, you know, we, we hope that some of them grow and turn into a Facebook or a Twitter or an Airbnb companies of kind of that scale and magnitude. So that's what we do. You know, we mostly invest around uh, a software theme, meaning that kind of anything where software is really the core technology for the business uh, we are interested in looking at. And then we take a little bit of a different approach to the business in that we believe very strongly in working closely with and helping our companies as they grow and scale. And so uh, unlike most venture firms, we have a big team here. So we have over 150 people today wow. and about two thirds of those people are actually on the post investment side who are working on a daily basis with our companies, helping them acquire customers, helping them do PR and marketing, uh, helping them kind of identify great executives or engineers to hire. And so the whole kind of MO of our business is, you know, that capital is obviously a great thing, but capital is kind of a commodity these days. And so we believe to be competitive in this market, you have to offer something other than capital to people. And, and that's what we intend to do through our, uh, you know, our team here. Sure. And most v fir VC firms don't even come close to offering that range of services to their investments. Is that fair to say? Uh, that is fair. Yeah, I think, you know, we've kind of designed, you know, definitely a new model. And uh, there are, you know, people who are doing a few things at the margin uh, that are, uh, you know, kind of in the same space that we're doing, but nobody's got the scale uh, of people and, and nobody's really built it into the DNA of the firm in the way that we have from the very beginning. No, that makes total sense. So what made you decide to write the book and what's the book called and about? Sure. The book is called Secrets of Sand Hill Road venture capital and how to get it. Um, and I wrote the book uh, because I've been in the tech business for about 25 years now. And as we talked about, you know, both as kind of initially, you know, a financier, a banker, and then as an operator, and then for the last 10 years uh, in the venture capital side. And I just felt like uh, there are so many things that I learned over time and so many nuances of the business that I thought could be helpful to anyone, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're in a startup company, or quite frankly, you just want to know you know, how does technology work and how does it impact the overall U.S. economy? Uh, and so I just felt like putting it all down in words and hopefully offering that uh, to uh, to that that uh, set of folks was, uh, you know, would be valuable to a lot of people in thinking about whether venture was a good place for them to be or startups or just kind of who wanted to learn how the business worked. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and like I told you before we started recording, I, I've actually, you guys were nice enough to send me uh, a pre-release copy and I, I read the thing and the one thing, well, the, there's a number of things but I that I took out of it, but the, the one thing that really fascinated me about the thing is, sure, you cover from beginning to end of why you raise VC money or, or maybe maybe you don't want VC money and everything right. up until selling your company or and or taking it to an IPO. But what it really did for me anyways is it got me thinking about just the whole thing and not only what the VCs and you guys are thinking about as you're investing, but from the mindset of the either the people working at a company and or the upper you know management, the CEO, those types of people, because I've been an employee, I've been in the C-suite, and it's interesting just to think about what other people are struggling with, right? And maybe you're not the yeah. direct person actually raising the capital, but reading this book, I was like, oh, I never thought of it like that <laughs> as like the CEO, or I never thought of that from what the VC's thinking about, right? And and that was the one big takeaway for me that I found. I was just like, it really got me thinking about the whole space and and it was really kind of eye opening. Obviously, I understand. I thought I understood it at least pretty decent. I learned a ton and you covered where sometimes you've read these. I've read these books and they get so complicated so fast that you it just your eyes gloss over and you kind of just like, what is happening? I don't know what I'm reading. And I found it to be entertaining and it was really simple to understand the different stages and working through the journey. 
Well, I'm uh, well. First of all, thank you. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm thrilled that you enjoyed it, and uh, I'm and I'm glad. I'm actually I'm really glad that you described it that way because that's that's really what I wanted to do. I think that the challenge in this business is for a long time it's been a black box to a lot of people, sure. right? It's kind of like you know, there just nobody really understood how it worked, and you know, you know, it's it's kind of got lure to it, but there's not a whole lot of information out there. And you know, part of my objective was I think if we can kind of demystify it and help people understand it better, quite frankly. Maybe that encourages more people to start companies. It encourages more people to join startups. And so, you know, I hope that if you, you know, the ideas of if we can democratize access to information, we might quite frankly also better democratize access to entrepreneurship, which, you know, is something that I, that I think, you know, this country really needs. Yeah, no, totally. And it's interesting when, to me, you broke it down, basically talking about the pros and cons of VC. So do you maybe want to dive a little bit deeper into that concept, why people should raise VC or, or maybe not raise VC yeah. money? Yeah, I, I, that's, yeah, that's a great point. I think um, we talk about this a lot in the book, but I think the, the way to think about this is, you know, venture capital is not necessarily, you know, kind of the perfect, you know, source of financing for every company. The way we think about it is, you know, are you trying to build a company that can be, you know, a Facebook or a Twitter or, you know, Airbnb over time? And what we mean by that is, is your objective to build a very big and a very enduring and, you know, ultimately a very kind of, you know, successful business? And if so, and that business also requires capital. So I'll give you an example. You know, we're an investor in Lyft, as you know, which right. recently went public. Yeah, you know, the reason for Lyft to raise capital from venture capitalists was because number one, they had a vision to build something that could be very big and ultimately a public company, and they've they've done a great job achieving that. But then also they needed obviously capital to do that. I mean, it's an expensive business to go be in all kinds of cities and acquire customers and acquire drivers. And so if you're in a business like that where, you know, kind of it takes, you know, essentially risk capital in order to be able to achieve the business objectives, uh, but it's it's obviously highly risky. I mean, Lyft uh, you know, could have turned out, you know, like a lot of companies, they could they could not have ultimately succeeded if they hadn't executed as well as they had. And that's really kind of the way to think about the sweet spot for venture capital is, you know, kind of does it have high risk, high capital intensivity? And, uh, you know, is there an alignment of objectives, right? So I think where people sometimes, you know, get get it wrong is, you know, if your goal is to build, you know, maybe a, a very nice business, but something that's relatively small in terms of the total size it can get to, that could be a fantastic opportunity, but probably raising venture capital for that is not a great idea because you're probably misaligned with the objectives and the incentives of your venture capitalists because they're going to want to push you, obviously, to build something that's you know kind of bigger and more broadly applicable to folks. So I think that's the first question that people just need to ask themselves: is you know kind of am I am I you know a candidate for this? And then once they do that, then what I hope the book helps them understand is: okay, if you take the money, what does that mean, right? How do you work with a venture capitalist? How do you think about valuation? How do you think about, you know, even, you know, kind of all the aspects of a term sheet that are relevant? Those are the things that I hope, uh, you know, we've done a good job explaining to people. No, I, I think you you did. The other thing that I, I think is very much related to, to what we just talked about that you cover in depth is where VCs actually get their money from and the life cycle yeah. of that money. Do you want to explain that and dive a bit deeper into that? Because I found that to be one of the most fascinating parts of the of the book because I think a lot of people don't think about that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's great. I'm glad you you like that. Yeah, we um, yeah, as you mentioned, there's a whole chapter on this, uh, and I use the example of uh, Yale University in the book because Yale is one of the oldest and uh, and quite frankly one of the most respected investors in venture capital, and you know. Firms like Yale or other educational institutions, right, they have to basically help support the educational mission of the university. So, uh, you know, hopefully their alumni give them money, uh, they right. donate money, and then Yale's job is to earn, you know, as high a return on that money as they can so that then every year they can basically take some of that money and give it to the university to pay for employee salaries or for tuition or all kinds of things that have to happen. And so, uh, you know, universities like Yale look to venture capital as you know, kind of a very potentially high returning asset class, right? Because they could invest in public markets or they could invest in bonds. And all those obviously have some kind of return profile. But venture is the segment of their uh, investments where they're really trying to generate very high returns. And that means, you know, something like maybe 25 or 30 percent kind of, you know, compounded, you know, uh, IRRs, which, you know, is pretty, uh, it's pretty serious kind of, uh, you know, challenge uh, to get to. Um, 
And so it, the reason I wrote about this is if you understand that, then you understand the incentives and the motivations of the venture capitalists, which is right. my job is to generate a very high return for Yale University or for a big foundation like the you know, Packard Foundation or the Hewlett Foundation. And so that then you know, creates the incentives for me as a venture capitalist to you know, want to create and, and need to be able to generate some very, very large companies that can ultimately be very valuable you know, as standalone businesses. And so, again, I think it's, you know, a lot of what I think, you know, we tried to articulate the book is you're right, which is you have to understand the life cycle in order to understand how that incents behavior. And then you as an entrepreneur or as an employee in a startup company, you know, can get the benefit of understanding why people may do things based on the incentive structures that they're uh, they're paying attention to. Yeah. It was also interesting when you talk about if a fund's at closer to the end of the life cycle, potentially Mm -hmm. worrying about not getting a second investment from that same fund, right? Where if it's earlier on, the chances are potentially a lot higher and you might not have to go to another VC firm to get money. That that was kind of interesting yep. to me that I never really thought of before. Do you want to explain that a little bit better than I just did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, know, you did a great job, but sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, add on to it. So uh, in the book, what you'll see, right, is that these venture funds have, you know, they have a life, right? So right. typically the life is about 10 years. Um, and so, as you mentioned, one of the things to be mindful of when you raise money is where is the venture capitalist in that life cycle of that fund? Because they may be investing in the first round of your financing today, you know, let's call it the Series A, right? The first sure. financing. But presumably, if you're successful, and sometimes even if you're not successful, you will need and want to raise more capital over the next two, four, six, eight years. And so one thing to be mindful of is, uh, you know, where is the VC in their fund life cycle? Because if they're investing in you and they're already in year six or seven of the fund, then when you need more money, they may already have exhausted all that capital in that fund. And uh, that means either that you need to go to other venture firms or you need to assume that this venture capitalist will be able to raise another fund and, and be able to fund you out of that. And so it's important as an entrepreneur to at least kind of understand, again, the nature of how these things could impact your your downstream funding and just be mindful uh, of you know some of those aspects that are kind of a little bit inside baseball for the for the venture capital firm but can have big implications for you as an entrepreneur no I, I think that's really great advice so how do people or how do you guys expect people to pitch to you guys are you looking for phone calls emails how do people actually get in front <laughs> of somebody at Andreessen Horowitz yeah so most of what we do um, tends to come in from some type of referral. So okay. uh, there are some things where people will just kind of, you know, cold email us. And that's great. But I would say, you know, kind of advice I would give to entrepreneurs is really work your network and figure out, okay, can I at least get some kind of warm introduction to somebody in the firm? And it doesn't need to be, you know, somebody's best friend, but at least some way to kind of, you know, get through a referral as opposed to a cold email. Uh, and in some respects, actually, it's a good kind of test of your mettle as an entrepreneur, which is, it's a good show of your ability to be creative and persistent and, you know, kind of work, work your network in a positive way to be able to get in. So that's typically how it happens. And then, you know, we will, you know, sit down. We, we really prefer doing face-to-face meetings with people. Uh, you know, we talk about this in the book a lot about the importance of team, for example, and why team is so important in the evaluation process. And it's a lot better to be able to evaluate the team, obviously, face-to-face and spend time with people. And so a lot of the interactions tend to happen that way, you know, through, you know, these pitch meetings. No, that makes total sense. So you covered something that I think a lot of people take for granted in in their pitch decks is educating the VC or their investor or really anybody on the actual size of the market. I think a lot of times people don't fully explain how potentially big the market size is. And it sounds like you would agree with that because you wrote a bit a bunch about it in the book. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree about it because, uh, number one, it's a really important part of the, val- of the evaluation process. And it's a hard thing sometimes. So may- let me give you an example. Sure. Um, you know, if you were if you uh, when when, you know, we were looking at Lyft, for example. Right. Okay. I mean, you know, a lot of the way people uh, evaluated the size of the market is they said, OK, well, we know that, that, that there's a taxi market. We know taxis do some amount of money. In fact, I heard the other day an anecdote. I don't know if these numbers are exactly right, but they're probably directionally right that. Um, at the time when Lyft uh, was raising money, the total amount of revenue in the San Francisco taxi cab market was under $100 million. Okay, so that meant, you know, for all the receipts the entire year, it generated $100 million. I think today between Lyft and Uber, 
uh, they do co- collectively about $1.5 billion in San Francisco. So, wow. uh, and that's just in one city, right? And so it's a good illustration of where if somebody were kind of stuck in this kind of mantra of the taxi market is really the way to estimate market size, you would have vastly underestimated the potential. And that might have caused you, quite frankly, to not want to invest in Lyft because you might have thought, hey, it just can't be that big ever. But um, but it's a challenge. And this is why I say I think it's part of the entrepreneur's job to help the VCs understand that, because particularly in a, in a thing like Lyft, you know, you had to conceive of this idea that the presence of, you know, a, a an application on a mobile phone that everybody's carrying around could actually increase the size of the available market. And, you know, you might have intuitively thought about that, but it took somebody like, you know, uh, you know, the founding team there, John and Logan, to really articulate that to us and help us understand their vision for why, you know, kind of ubiquity of cell phones could actually create a market that was just vastly different in size than what, you know, kind of a comparable taxi market could have looked like. So I think it's a real important thing and something really that the entrepreneurs need to help the VCs kind of think through so that we can really understand the vision and the expansiveness of their thinking. Oh, I think that's really good advice. So I'm curious, though, what other advice or is there any myths or things people should or shouldn't do when putting together a pitch deck or and or pitching to you guys? Sure. Yeah, there's a couple things I'd point out. And again, you'll see in the book, there's a, you know, as you've seen, there's a whole section on this. Yeah. Um, but a couple things. I think one is, again, um, as I mentioned, that, you know, understanding how venture capitalists evaluate deals, I think, is important to knowing how you want to pitch the deal. And one of the biggest, you know, areas of evaluation is team. And uh, that may sound obvious, uh, but I will tell you, a lot of entrepreneurs, quite frankly, don't spend very much time on the team. Right. And what we're really trying to assess is, let's assume the market is big, which means it's probably going to be really competitive. And so the real question we're trying to figure out is, why would we invest in this team that's currently pitching versus any other team that might come along with a similar idea? And the kinds of things we're trying to look at, I'll give you, maybe it's easiest by way of an example. Um, we're an investor in a company called Tanium that you may have heard of, which yeah. is an enterprise security company. And the founder there, uh, Orion, and his uh, his father actually is his co-founder, David, uh, they had started a, a security company about 15 years ago called Big Fix, which was really in the same space, the endpoint security market. And Tanium really is kind of, you know, the updated version 2.0 of that company. And when we, evalu- when we kind of had the team discussion in our, uh, in our pitch meeting evaluation, we said, okay, we believe this is a big market, right? So endpoint security is pretty big. And w- could we conceive of another team that has the level of domain expertise or, the, or kind of the background in this area that could execute on that market better than David and Orion? And that was really, you know, 90% of our evaluation at that point in time was really kind of the, the kind of incredible fit between the background of this team and the, and the opportunity they were prosecuting. Those are the kinds of things we're trying to assess. Um, you know, sometimes we're assessing, you know, leadership capabilities, but it's so much around those qualitative nature of what is it that you know, what is the secret you know that you've earned that's different than someone else who might not have had that experience uh, knows that, you know, really puts you in the catbird seat in terms of being able to actually, you know, kind of go after a great opportunity. No, it makes a lot of sense. So you guys invest in, say, my company. How do you guys work with me and my startup? Because you kind of covered it at the beginning, but I really want to dive yeah, a lot deeper sure. into that because I think it's very, very useful and valuable. Absolutely. So uh, the way it works is we have a series of teams. We actually have five separate teams today, and they cover areas like uh, you know sales and business development, uh, PR and marketing, um, talent, so helping you know identify and recruit uh great executives, as well as great engineers. And the way we work is when we first start working with a company, we do what's called an onboarding meeting with them. And we sit around the table with hopefully the whole executive team from the company. And we say, hey, look, tell us about what are the things you're focused on for the next six or 12 months? You know, tell us about engineering, tell us about marketing, tell us about sales, whatever are the key goals. And then we try to kind of identify where are the places that we can plug our resources into to help uh, improve the chances of the company being able to achieve those goals and hopefully you know, even exceed them. And importantly, um, we recognize and we're very, very conscious of the fact that we are venture capitalists and that you know, we are not the ones building these companies. The entrepreneurs uh, are obviously are doing the hard day-to-day work. And so we've got to be really careful to not you know, forget about that and overstep. So we're not going to ever go in and perform a function for a company 
we're not going to go ever go in and actually like be an interim manager in a company uh, because we recognize that kind of the magic of what we're investing in is the entrepreneurial spirit that's in that company. And the last thing we'd ever want to do is kind of interfere with that. But our hope is that we can kind of show people with the resources and the relationships and networks we have that we can really help them identify new customer opportunities and other ways to help them grow the company most effectively. No, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. So the thing that you covered a lot in the book that I also found really fascinating was the whole how it used to take companies four-ish so years to go either maybe get sold or, or IPO. Right. Now it's taking about a decade. A and then the vesting side of that as well. Do you maybe want to dive into that a little bit deeper? Sure. Yeah. Um, this is a this is a, a very interesting topic. So I'll, I'll try to kind of see if I can uh, explain it in a few words. Sure. Uh, but as you described, uh, right, oftentimes for if you look at the history of venture capital, which goes back kind of you know roughly 40 years in the U.S. at least, you know it usually took about six six and a half years from the start of a company to going public. Right. And as part of that, as as you know, you and your listeners probably know, many people in these companies get uh, equity compensation, so they get options in the company that you know re represent a portion of the equity in the company, and those options vest over time, meaning that you know I may give you 100 shares of options today, but uh, over a four-year period, you will kind of you know radically vest them over that time period, and the whole idea there, of course, is you're trying to create a long-term economic incentive for the employee to kind of remain and be productive at the company. Um, and that four-year time period made a lot of sense when companies were going public, call it six, six and a half years, because, you know, you don't hire everybody, of course, on day one. But that would mean for many employees, by the time they were fully vested with their shares, that the company would be public and therefore there would be a public market that they could sell those, those shares into. Um, one of the challenges that we have today in the industry is companies are staying private a lot longer, as you mentioned. So uh, typically, you know, kind of 10 plus years and so what that means is a lot of employees will vest their shares, but those shares will not be, um, uh, you know, publicly traded. And so they won't be able to sell them uh, in the way that they used to. And so it's a real challenge for companies because they clearly want, uh, you know, employees to be able to enjoy the appreciation of the, of the equity options they've had. Uh, but it does kind of, uh, you know, require us to kind of rethink about what's the appropriate time frame in some cases for options. And are there other creative things that companies need to do to help allow employees to be able to kind of, uh, you know, kind of enjoy the benefits of, of equity, but uh, potentially not have to wait, you know, five, six, seven, eight years before they can actually sell those shares in the public market. So it's a it's a it's a it's a real issue and one that the, you know, the industry, both on the venture side and quite frankly, on the you know company side is struggling to figure out, you know, how best do you kind of, you know, incent uh, employees, given the time periods, are just dramatically different than uh, than they originally were. No, I I think that's interesting. And the and then let's cover the flip side of that because obviously, when somebody like Andreessen Horowitz puts money into your company, you guys are getting a certain percentage. And how do you guys I, balance the percentage you're getting with the vesting of employees? Plus, you know, obviously yeah. getting more you want to up the share value because, and then people get diluted and it, you cover it really well in the book. So do you want to talk about all that? Because it's, it's quite interesting how that all plays out. All right. I'm going to try, I'm going to try. You're, you're hitting on some really fun topics, but uh, these, uh, these might not, uh, you know, well, do it's well all in the book. In, people go read longer characters. about them in the book. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So yes, right. If, uh, if you don't follow what I'm saying, just pick up the book. So thank you. Yeah. So yeah, when we, as you, as you said, look, when we invest in a company, you know, we end up owning some percentage of the company. So let's just say 25%, which is often at the early stage, you know, that's a reasonable percentage sure. for a company to sell and for a venture capitalist to own. And then what happens over time is there's two ways you can get diluted, right? Which is basically is a fancy way of saying your ownership interest goes down. Uh, one is, as you said, is at, over time, as the company hires more employees, they will want to give those employees options. And so those options can't come out of thin, thin air, right? They have to come from the company. And so when the company issues more options, that means, you know, uh, you know, kind of I now own slightly less of the company than I did before, right? Because the, the number of shares is growing, your denominator is growing. And then, you know, as you also, I think, alluded to, the second way that dilution happens is when the company raises more money, because again, the mechanism of raising more money is somebody puts money in and in exchange for that money, they get shares. And again, those shares, you know, don't get created out of thin air. They actually have to come from, you know, that same pool of, of the shares. And so therefore, again, 
um, you know, kind of I now own less of the company. The way the venture capitalists try to protect themselves on that is often we will reserve money when we make an initial investment in order to invest some money in a later round of the company. And so if we own 25% of the company, for example, and we think the company is going to raise money down the line, we might, you know, hold back in our on our own books enough money so that, you know, at the next round of financing, we can invest more dollars in order to be able to kind of maintain our percentage ownership. And so that's the way the venture capitalists try and protect themselves. Obviously, for employees, you know, it's a harder thing for them to do. You know, the hope over time for employees is for people who are doing well, the company will often give them another set of options. They'll do what's called a refresher set of options to hopefully help them kind of get more ownership in the company over time, even as obviously, you know, the company itself you know, is continuing to have some dilution from from this additional investment. And so there's this constant, you know, kind of, uh, you know, yin and yang, I guess. And, you know, it all works out fine as long as the value of the company keeps going up because, you know, of course, I'd rather own 20% of a company that's doing great than 25% of zero because 25% of zero is still zero. And so nobody really worries about a lot of these things, obviously, when everything's going up nicely, uh, you know, up and to the right. But, you know, these are the things that can become more challenging as companies mature and potentially aren't growing at the same pace they were or or aren't achieving the same objectives that, you know, they had intended. And that's where, you know, kind of, you know, sometimes, you know, things can get a little bit more challenging. No, I I think that makes a lot of sense. The the other thing that I found really interesting that you cover quite a bit in the book is the different roles of the from your guys's side on, on the investment side and the people inside the company, and then creating a board at the different stages of the companies. Do you want to maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot in the book on board, kind of what's the role of the board, and kind of I have a little bit of a section on kind of good board member, bad board member. Yeah. And I think the most important point, you know, to recognize, and sometimes, unfortunately, I think venture capitalists get this wrong, is that, you know, no matter how smart you are, no matter how involved you are as a board member, there's just no way you understand the company at the level of depth that somebody who is inside the company does. And so I think where boards can go wrong is they believe based upon talking to the CEO or reading a board deck that they know more about kind of the state of the company or the capabilities of the business. And, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, boards overstep their bounds and, you know, offer advice that just doesn't uh, doesn't resonate or doesn't take into account lots of things they just don't know about how the business is working. And so the best functioning boards are those that recognize that their main job is to provide kind of, you know, high level guidance and counseling to the to the CEO. And of course, boards have the ultimate authority to either, you know, to, to add or remove a CEO. And if the board really feels like, you know, the company isn't doing what it needs to be doing, the mechanism by which they do that is should be to kind of have that conversation with the CEO. And if that behavior doesn't change to potentially think about changing the CEO, but it's really the wrong behavior to kind of overstep the CEO and try and kind of get too entangled in the day to day of the business. Um, that's I, I've never seen that go well. It's always an incredible failure case for the company. And quite frankly, it's really unfair to the entrepreneur because it really undermines the entrepreneur, you know, in front of their employees. And so much better for the board to kind of have the hard conversation with the CEO about whether, you know, the things, you know, he or she is doing are appropriate for the business and and can continue that way versus, you know, overstepping their bounds. No, I I think that that makes a lot of sense. So I want to cover the sale and the IPO of a company. Do you want to give a little bit of overview of what you talk about in the book on, on both of those ending of a company? Sure. Yeah, so when we make an investment in a company, as I mentioned earlier, um, we really are, you know, believing at the time that this company can go public, can can have an IPO, because that's that means that the company has grown to the scale that you know we all aspire for it too, and it's become very valuable and it's doing a really important role uh, in the ecosystem. Now, the reality of the business, unfortunately, is that most companies don't get there. Obviously, a lot of our companies just don't succeed at all, unfortunately. Uh, but for the ones that succeed, you know, still the vast majority, probably 80% of them uh, end up getting sold or acquired by companies and about 20% of them go public. And so, you know, there are very different, you know, things to think about, right? Oftentimes you sell a company because uh, either maybe the market size wasn't as big as you thought it was. And so therefore the kind of economics of the business just don't work as well, or maybe the product, uh, you know, has changed over time and you're no longer kind of competitive, 
those are often, you know, good reasons why companies do sell to another company is because maybe the business can actually survive and thrive better as part of a bigger organization that is a standalone company. Uh, and then sometimes, of course, there are just companies that operationally just don't execute well, even in a good market with a good product. And in those cases, you know, if you can't kind of find a way to bring a new team into the company that can, you know, address that execution, you might find that, you know, exiting through an acquisition makes sense. But the ultimate goal for most of these companies is to try to become public companies uh, because that allows them, obviously, to continue to be enduring and deliver, you know, the value they've been delivering to customers, you know, albeit in a much bigger scale. Um, and that's, uh, you know, we're now, as you've probably seen if you're reading the news lately, you know, for a long time, we didn't have a lot of IPOs uh, in the tech industry. And we're still kind of pretty far below historical standards. But at least this year or so far, we've had, you know, a decent number of IPOs and, Looks like we're on track, hopefully, to end the year, you know, kind of probably around 50 or so, uh, you know, VC-backed technology IPOs, which is, again, by historical standards, quite frankly, still still a small number, but at least, you know, improving relative to where it's been for the last three to five years. No, I, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And it's actually quite fascinating how the landscape is changing. And that was actually going to be kind of my next question to you is, how do you see the landscape change in the last 10 years? And and where do you think it will yeah. potentially go? Because you talk a bit about it in the book, and it was kind of interesting on the crowdfunding side and, and other things. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say the biggest change over the last 10 years has been um, kind of the emergence of the institutional seed market. And what I mean by that, just so uh, everyone understands, is, you know, for a long time, we had these things called angels, right? And I think we mentioned them at the beginning of the of the conversation, and angels were, you know, were and are individuals who are typically investing their own money. They might be writing a $15,000 check or a $100,000 check, but it's typically on behalf of themselves. And what happened over the last 10 years is seed as an actual institutional category, meaning where there are firms that raise kind of traditional institutional capital like other venture firms, has grown tremendously. And that's really changed the landscape for uh, for the business here because, uh, it really has meant that, you know, kind of whereas before, you know, a Series A venture capitalist might have been the first one to put institutional money into a company, there's now a whole set of seed firms kind of upstream of that, of those firms today uh, that are in in the company first. And that changes how you think about competitive dynamics in the industry and has made it, you know, a very competitive market and, you know, I think very, very good for entrepreneurs in terms of available capital. The other big thing that's changed, which we just alluded to also over the last 10 to 15 years, has been this concept of companies staying private a lot longer. And uh, what that means, among other things, is that there's an opportunity in the private markets to kind of raise funding at lots of different stages that just didn't exist before. And, uh, you know, and a lot of the appreciation in the in the companies now is happening in private markets versus public markets. There's a great anecdote that I always like to use here, which is uh, when Microsoft went public, uh, they were valued at about a $350 million market cap, which is hard to imagine uh, anymore. Uh, I think just literally the other day, it crossed a trillion dollars in market right. cap. So, you know, if you do the quick math, I think that's like 3,000x of a return in Microsoft from when they went public to today. Um, you know, Facebook, on the other hand, went public at $100 billion and has done incredibly well and is valued, I think, at like 500 or $550 billion. So, you know, it's grown very well in the public markets, but certainly a much smaller multiple. If you do the math and you kind of assume that Microsoft, excuse me, Facebook, you know, could achieve that same 3,000x 3, 3, increase in the public markets as Microsoft has done, um, you know, Facebook would be worth more than the entire global GDP. Wow. Uh, so it's, a, you know, obviously that's probably not going to happen as much as you might like that if you're a Facebook shareholder. Sure. <laughs> um, but the point of the illustration is that kind of more and more of the appreciation of these companies is happening in the private markets relative to the public markets. And so, as you know, to your question, I think what that means, you know, kind of fast forwarding for the next five or 10 years is I think you will continue to see more capital come into the private markets in order to kind of, you know, be able to capture some of this appreciation. Uh, we already see that from, you know, some players like SoftBank and even some, you know, big, you know, kind of sovereign wealth funds and for various other players. So I think the private markets are going to continue to expand as a very, very significant source of capital for lots of these companies uh over the next 10 years and you know i think that's a good thing for entrepreneurship it's a good thing for new company formation you know it's probably not as good as good of a thing for the public markets in the sense that you know for people who can only invest in the public markets they probably are not going to have the same level of growth and appreciation that you might you know expect to find in the private markets 
No, that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting. So I'm curious, you cover in the book about building relationships with potential people and acquirers before you're even really thinking yeah. of selling. And some of those could potentially be your competitors. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I think I use the analogy, which maybe is not a great analogy in the book, but that, you know, kind of you always want to, you know, you may not want to go to the dance, but you want to get invited at least, right? That's kind of always your, your goal, sure. uh, you know, whether you're in high school or, or quite frankly, whether you're a startup company. And so I think about it in that context, which is if you're a company, um, it's always good, you know, your goal may not to be to be acquired and you hope, you know, you can grow into a public company, but, you know, it's probably good to know who the potential acquirers are and figure out, are there ways where you can start to build relations with them? And so sometimes that can just be, it could be as simple as literally a personal relationship, other times, maybe there's business development opportunities that you can do together as a way to get to know each other. But, you know, all those things kind of, you know, at least, you know, give you visibility to what some of those potential companies are doing. And, uh, you know, to the extent that you decide you want to uh, sell the company or, you know, maybe it, it financially will make sense for you to sell the company, uh, you, you want to kind of have those relationships started. It's, it's, uh, there's an old saying in uh, the acquisition world. Uh, I don't know who said it, but... Uh, uh, which is companies basically uh, get bought, not sold. And what that means is kind of, you know, you want that organic pull of other companies who kind of want to buy you as opposed to you trying to market yourself and sell yourself to a company. Obviously, that's a much less favorable place to be. And so I view this whole concept of relationship building and kind of early, you know, relationship development as a way for you to kind of build those relationships that ultimately might enable you to get bought, not sold, if that's the right course to go. And, you know, I think you could do that in a way where you don't compromise your technology and you don't have to give them access to proprietary information, but you can find ways to work together that at least make sure that, you know, if that dance is happening, you, you know, you're on the receiving end of the invitation. Sure. Well, and you could potentially send each other business for a while before one of you actually picks up the other one, right? Absolutely. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, you know, it's, uh, I don't want to strain the analogy too much, but you know, you know, dating before you get married turns out to actually be a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. So I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, and I'm sure you probably get asked this all the time, but selfishly, I'm really curious about it. Do you think we're in another bubble? Yeah. So I've, I've actually written a lot about this, not just, there's a little bit in the book, but also I've, I've written a lot kind of, uh, you know, in my, in our, our blog on this. Yeah. Um, the, the quick answer is no. So, uh, and let me just give you a couple, just I'll give you a few data points just so you sure. have a sense. So in, sure. in 99 and 2000, obviously, which was the height of the bubble, there were more than 700 IPOs of tech companies in those two years. In the 10-year period from, you know, kind of 2009 to today, there's been about 450 IPOs. So we, we literally have had over 10 years, uh, barely two-thirds the number we had in two years. Um, and when you look at the maturity of the companies, it's really starkly different. So for companies that went public in 99 and 2000, the revenue on average was about $17 million in annual revenue for the companies. Uh, I think if you look over the last 10 years, it's something like $170 million. So kind of, you know, 10 X the maturity of the companies. And so number one, I just think it's always fun. You know, it's always fun to make the bubble comparison. I think the reality is the numbers are very different. And then the other thing that's really different uh, and Mark Andreessen uh, used to tell this story is just the sheer market size and therefore the opportunity for these businesses to work uh, and to work at scale. And the best example that Mark used to always talk about was when they sold uh, Netscape mm -hmm. uh, to AOL, that happened in 1998, I think was when they sold it. The total number of internet users was something, you know, less than 100 million users, right? So that meant the entire market that, that uh, Netscape could sell into was 100 million people who were on the internet. Uh, today, obviously, we know that number is, you know, kind of in the several billions and probably going to five to seven billion over the coming years as things like Android and other low cost operating systems, you know, permeate beyond just the, you know, kind of the, uh, the developed world. And so when you think about that, what that puts into context, I think what we're seeing today, which is that businesses that just couldn't work in 99, 2000, because the market size was not big enough relative to the cost that it would acquire, would cost to acquire those customers Lots of those things can work today. And that's why you see, for example, you know, Instacart, uh, which is a company in our portfolio that does, you know, grocery delivery, a company like Instacart can work today, even though Webvan didn't work in 99, 2000. That's not because, you know, kind of, it's just inherently a bad business, but Webvan, quite frankly, never had a chance of success because 
there just weren't enough consumers who ultimately could you know, access that relative to the cost it, it uh, required uh, for them to actually be able to service those customers and acquire them. And so, you know, this is not to say, of course, that every company is going to be successful and, you know, kind of there are always places where valuation sometimes can get out of whack with the fundamentals of the business. But in general, what gives us optimism about why, you know, we don't see this as another bubble is just the sheer kind of opportunity size that exists out there. And quite frankly, the level of technological innovation that we continue to see from just tremendously, you know, kind of smart and aggressive and, uh, you know, capable entrepreneurs. No, I, I agree with you. I just I, I think it's important to get somebody like yourself at a really, really well known popular company to talk about this stuff because I think it puts yeah. a lot of people at ease, right? And and they're I don't think people worry as much or hopefully they don't worry as much. Um but we're kinda coming to the end of the show, but I, I really want to get kind of some final thoughts. Do you have any advice, final advice for people out there, either on the investment side or, or on the startup side, or, or maybe a bit of both? Yeah, look, my biggest advice is, uh, you know, I, I hope, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, the reason I wrote this book is because I really think that we need to democratize access to the kinds of information that, quite frankly, has been, you know, held pretty tightly in the past. And I hope that by doing so, that encourages more people to think about entrepreneurship and think about the role of technology uh, in, in our society. And so I guess my biggest advice would be, you know, kind of hopefully people, you know, see the book as an educational opportunity and that then creates, you know, new and interesting economic opportunities for people. And then, you know, I'd say the other biggest piece of advice is, you know, uh, really understanding, you know, just like in any part of business, part of what I wanted to kind of explain here is, you know, if you're going to take money from venture capitalists or you're going to start a company, you have to understand, you know, what makes those, those individuals tick and what incentives they have. And I think that makes you a better entrepreneur and it'll make you, you know, better adept at the capital raising process. And so my best advice is kind of, you know, understand who it is that you're thinking about partnering with, uh, you know, what they bring to the table, what you're looking for them to bring to the table and, uh, you know, approach it in, your way, in, in the same way you would any other relationship, which is, uh, you know, kind of build that relationship over time and really kind of, uh, you know, take to heart uh, what it is that you think uh, the value is that that venture capitalist can bring to your business. No, I, I think that's great. And just to reiterate, I, I said this kind of at the beginning of the show, I've been on the design side my whole career, basically. And I obviously don't come from a financial background. And I very much understood everything that you covered in the book. I, I think you, you <laughs> simplified it. But I think part of the problem with some of these books is people are like, well, I'm not a I'm not a, the CEO, or I'm not the a chief financial officer. So I, I'm not going to read that. But like I said earlier, is right, right. somebody obviously I'm not those people, but understanding where those people are, what they're dealing with or understanding where you guys are coming from on the investment side. And then also understanding where the company I'm either working for or a partner of is going based on what, how we got financed, right? Whether we're bootstrapping or whether we're a venture fund or somewhere in the middle, right? And sometimes you're bootstrapped at the beginning and then you take venture fund. And so for me, just right. understanding the life cycle of being at a company for five, 10 years before it potentially gets acquired and or goes public was really useful for me even, right? And so I just kind of want to reiterate that because I found it, like I said, a new number of times, really a really great read. Well, I appreciate that. I I, uh, I sent a preview copy of the book to uh, my my parents. Okay. And uh, when I when when my mom sent me a note back and she said, you know, I understood seventy five percent of what you said. I felt like uh, I had also I, I felt pretty good. I felt like that's I had awesome. accomplished the goal of uh, of truly demystifying venture capital. No, that's very cool. But we're we're at the end of the show. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about Andreessen Horowitz, the book, and any other links you want to mention. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, Andreessen Horowitz, we are just at a16z.com. That's a16z.com. And there's, you'll see all kinds of content there. You'll see blog posts, videos, all kinds of great stuff. Podcast. Uh, the book, as you mentioned, is called uh, Podcast. Yes, Podcast. Of course, I apologize. I forgot. <laughs> uh, the book is called Secrets of Sand Hill Road. You can actually uh, you know, pre-order it today on Amazon. So if you go search on Amazon, you'll find it there. And uh, the release is on June 4th. But uh, if you want to make sure you get your copy first, uh, pre-order today. And then you can follow me on Twitter at S-K-U-P-O-R on Twitter as well. So hopefully between one of those three sources, uh, we can uh, we can get some content that's relevant for what you're looking for. 
Perfect, Scott. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy day to be on the show. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Kevin, for the time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. And keep building the future.